everyone. Oh, good, everyone's still awake. That's always exciting, the beginning of the message. Uh, just join me as we pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word to us. Lord, as we share um, and look at one of your stories that we find in the Bible this morning, we ask that you would touch our hearts, that you would um, settle in our spirits something from you that we would be sure and certain comes from you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we have been in a series um, here at Northern looking at the lives of faithful people recorded for us in the Bible or in history and what we can learn from them and apply to our own lives. And this morning we are looking at the life of a man named Gideon. And Gideon lived in the period of the Judges, which you can read about in the book of the Bible that's helpfully titled Judges. Yeah, it's the one. (laughs) So this is the part of God's story um, with Israel that was characterised by kind of seasonal leadership um, by people who were known as judges. And their role wasn't really um, judicial or as a mediator that we might think of judges now. Their role was um, often much more military oriented and they had this kind of um, a little bit of a prophetic role to restore the people back to God. So Gideon lived in a period of time where the land of the Hebrew people was under the occupation of a neighbouring country, um, Midian. And you might remember that Midian was the country that Moses fled to when he left Egypt. Um, And chapter 6 in Judges is where we find this story. And as it opens, we find that Israel is once again being oppressed, just as they were in Egypt. Uh, This oppression is described as consequences for the people as a result of their, their lack of faith in God and their worship of idols. And it goes like this. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and they ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts and it was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So this is the situation that Israel finds itself in. And this is where we meet a young man called Gideon. Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press when we meet him. Now, this um, is a picture, if you've on the screen, hopefully. This is a threshing floor. Um, it's, hard, it's a hard surface. It's usually circular, where wheat could be beaten by hand or with the help of animals, in that smaller picture there. the grain would stay, my understanding is, the grain would stay on the hard surface and the chaff, the bit that you don't want to eat or process, um, flies away in the wind, blows away. So I'm not an expert, but it feels like to me that there are two kind of really crucial things for um, wheat threshing to be successful. You need a large, hard surface and you need a breeze. This is a wine press as it would have existed in the times of um, Gideon. It's a hole dug into the earth so that you could stack all the grapes in there and then people would step on them to crush them. And at the bottom of that, um, kind of down the hill, they would then have a space where the wine would be collected. So if you think about Gideon standing in this hole to thresh wheat where you need a large surface and a breeze, it's probably not the most efficient way to thresh wheat, one would expect. But there are two things that we find Gideon in, um, find out about Gideon in this situation. The first is that he's not doing this task very efficiently. But the second, and I think more insp- importantly, is that despite the restrictions and the limitations um, and the circumstances that Gideon finds himself in, he has thought creatively about how he can plant, how he can harvest his family's crops. Conditions um, are not ideal for Gideon, but he has this kind of stubbornness in his personality that some of us might relate to that says, you know what, I'm doing it anyway. (laughs) Um, I've got a small person in my family that's a little bit like that. Um, It was a bit made about this situation that perhaps Gideon was fearful and in hiding, and he probably was, but under the circumstances, 
think this is pretty smart. He doesn't try, um, if he doesn't try it this way, if he doesn't try and figure out how to use the wine press differently, he loses his crops and potentially his life. If he refuses to try to thresh the wheat at all, then he'll starve. And it's into this place that God sends a messenger, an angel, to Gideon. So if we look back to the passage in Judges 6, it goes like this. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Oprah that belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> this is interesting. Gideon is a farmer. He's not a fighter. He, um, he's a survivalist, maybe. Maybe a strategist. This particular moment in his life, warrior is probably not how we would describe him. But God sees Gideon differently than the world might. And God sees us differently than the world might. God sees potential. And here's what happens next. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all of the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if I have found favour in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait for your return. So alongside his stubbornness and creativity, we all see this, see this kind of um, boldness in Gideon. He basically says, if you're with me, God, why does life look like this? Why am I threshing wa- um, wheat in a wine press then? This is something we've probably all thought, not the wheat and the wine press thing, but I wonder if you've ever voiced that to God. Why does life look like this? The Psalms in the Bible record a number of um, poems and prayers for us that cry out to God in exactly this same way, kind of like the one that Paul read out for us earlier. God is big enough to deal with our questions and living life well with God starts with us being completely open with God about how we feel and where we're at. And Gideon is really good at this. You'll see it again and again um, if you read through this story. The next thing that we learn from this little encounter about Gideon (coughs) is that he sees himself as the least, the weakest. He is not the pick of the bunch when it comes to warriors. But God says to him, I will be with you. I will bring victory to Israel through you. The last thing this little episode um, gives us is that Gideon's response, his first response, other than, you know, asking a few clarifying questions, is actually worship. He asks for a sign, but the sign is that the angel will stay in that spot and receive an offering to God from Gideon. From Gideon. So Gideon kind of demonstrates his own faith in the sign that he asks for. If you with me on that one. So the angel says that he'll stay. And that's enough, actually, for Gideon. He goes away and prepares an offering. Now, food is scarce. We've just read that beginning of the passage. But Gideon goes away and he kills a goat and prepares an offering. And all of this he does, trusting that the angel will stay exactly where he said. Gideon has a sense of faith in the sign that he asked for. Do you see that? Well, God has recognised that Gideon is a warrior and tells him his plan for Gideon to lead an army to defeat the Midianites, his first task for Gideon is actually focused on sorting out the Israelites and bringing them back to God. There's a recurring pattern that we see in the book of Judges that Israel um, has peace for a time and they're kind of they're with God and then everyone begins to, to do as they see fit in their own eyes, is how Judges puts it. 
and they step away from God. And this leads to judgment and then they experience unrest, periods of unrest and sometimes war in that space. So in the process of restoring Israel, God asks Gideon to start with their hearts. God asks Gideon to tear down his father's Asherah poles and the altar to Baal to replace them with an altar to Yahweh, to God, and to sacrifice one of his dad's prized bulls on that altar. And Gideon does that, but he does it at night so he won't get caught by anyone in his family or the rest of the townspeople. He's pretty afraid of his family. He's the, he's the youngest, right? Remember, he's the weakest. He's afraid of his family. He's also afraid of the rest of the people living in that area. And, like, fair enough. The people um, are experiencing oppression and Baal is the god of, um, you know, little g-god, um, idol, idol god, of rainfall and the harvest and fertility. The favour of this god is meant to bring the abundance of food and family to the area, but it isn't doing that. And when the people discover the torn down altar and the sacrificed prize bull of Gideon's dad, the people are furious and word gets around that it was Gideon that did it. And then his dad has this peculiar response. I think it's, um, you know, the the story doesn't say so, but, you know, when I read it, I go, yeah, God's in that response. Gideon's dad's, um, this this is how it goes from verse 30. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash, He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and cutting down the Asherah pole. Fear justified, just saying. (laughs) But Joash shouted to the mob that confronted him, Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. It's really interesting. Um, this convinces people. This is enough. Gideon's dad says, you know what? If Baal's a real god, he'll sort it out himself. And so Gideon gets his reputation of being the one who um, has opposed Baal. Um, Starts to feel a bit like a warrior. So now the people are, you know, starting to get back on track to coming back to Yahweh God. And Gideon is encouraged in his faith. Encouraged kind of comes from that word courage. All the things that we talked about earlier today require courage. And this gives Gideon courage. The next step is the battle itself in order to free the people. And there's a lot in this kind of battle story. It goes for a couple of chapters. So I'm just going to give you the highlights version and encourage you to read that in your own time. Gideon is unsure of his ability to lead. I'm seeing a theme here, aren't you? (laughs) So he goes to God and God gives him assurance and encouragement through the signs that he asks for. This is the story of the fleeces, if you've heard that story before. It's at the end of Judges 6, if you want to read that. <clears throat> God tells Gideon that he has, um, then God tells Gideon that he has too many men. So Gideon rounds up an army, he gets about 20,000 people to follow him. It's amazing for someone who's the weakest and the least. But God wants it to be clear that it's not the, the men who have defeated the enemy, but it's God who wins the victory. So Gideon's army is whittled down to 300. And God says, perfect. That sounds good. 300 sounds good to me. And here, Gideon doesn't doubt God. He doesn't say, hold on. Hold on a second. Do you want a few more people? He has no doubt there. He does exactly as he's instructed. He sends the majority of those people home. But then we see that Gideon is unsure of the actual battle itself. He knows God, he knows, God knows his heart and God gives him a provision in his commandment. He says, God says to Gideon, if you're feeling afraid, go down and listen to the conversation of the enemy in their tents. And so Gideon goes and in that moment as he listened to two Midianites share about a dream and the interpretation of that dream, the dream is about Gideon taking the camp and he's encouraged. That'll do, that's enough. So he attacks the camp just as God has said. And it's worth noting that um, God doesn't change the situation. There's still 300 men. There's still a camp full of um, enemy people occupying the land. He just changes God's, uh, Gideon's perception of it. Gideon's faith is strengthened in this process. Later on, there are some other leaders um, within Israel's 
clans that are angry with Gideon and they, um, they think he's out to take their glory. They've been leading stuff, they've been doing a lot of work and they're upset that he didn't call them to be part of this great victory. <clears throat> and um, he gives the honour back to God and back to them. He's like, you know what, I didn't really do all that much. Like, you guys, you guys did all the hard work and God did um, the most amazing work. I didn't really do anything. The people um, then seek out Gideon to make him their king. They say, you rule over us, you and your sons. He says, I will not. Yahweh God is your king. So um, instead he requests that they bring him some of their jewellery, which they gladly do. And out of that he kind of melts it down and constructs an ephod. Um, Traditionally an ephod was a garment that was worn by priests. It's not clear exactly what, um, what it was specifically that... Gideon created or why? There's lots of different reasons why people think that he might have done that. But it seems to me that he wanted to create something that recalled the victory and pointed to that victory belonging to God to remind the people to seek and glorify God. Sadly, at the end of um, Judges 8, you'll find that this ephod becomes a source of idolatry and the people worship the ephod instead of worshipping God. And so they remain in peace during Gideon's lifetime, but when he dies, their idolatry escalates and once again they take steps away from God. That's the story of Gideon in a nutshell. Throughout the book of Judges, if you were to read through it, there's a series of cycles. It's kind of this descent of the people um, and then each time the deterioration kind of gets worse and worse. They have a brief reprieve under the leadership of a judge who brings them back to God and then they go back to their ways. In this story of Gideon, there's also a cycle, but it's a cycle upward of increasing faith. God grows faith in Gideon through his actions. Last week we saw that God grows faith in Hannah through waiting. But here we see a different way that God produces faith. From the beginning, we know that Gideon has like a small level of faith in Yahweh. He knows enough to know who the angel is representing. And through the story, his faith deepens. At first, Gideon needs to go to God with all of his doubts and fears. I'm the least, I'm the smallest, I can't do this, like where are you? And that's okay. That is a really great place to start. And if you um, haven't done that ever before, or you're in a place where you aren't um, walking with Jesus in that way yet, God can take it. God's big, really big. If you tell him what you really think, that's okay. If there's a question on your heart, you take that to God. God can hear where you're at and meet you where you are. But as we deepen in our faith, we don't stay in that place. As our faith grows, we maybe don't need to bring our fears to God as much. This doesn't mean that we don't feel it, but we're encouraged and we know that God is bigger, that God can be trusted. What we see in Gideon's story is that now he needs help for guidance. For guidance, He can deal with the fear so long as he knows that God will be there, that he has God's presence. And maybe this is where you're at. Maybe you're seeking God's direction. Maybe if you know that story, the idea of fleeces um, sounds like a good idea to you. And fleeces are okay. There's nothing wrong with fleeces. But they aren't an example of God, of, for us of seeking God's guidance. This is God meeting Gideon where he is in his faith journey. It's not a kind of model for us to follow. God will meet you where you are at in your faith. God is looking out for you. God is the shepherd who searches for us. He's not hard to find. But God wants us to get to a place in our faith where we know (coughs) what Jesus would do if Jesus were us say that again for you. God wants us to get to a place in our faith where we know what Jesus would do if Jesus were us. Towards the end of Gideon's story, we see that he isn't doubting God or himself as much. His faith has grown so that now he's not asking. He knows the answer is that he's not to become king. He doesn't have to check that with God. He's sure this is not God's plan. That's not what God wants, I'm sure. Gideon is not perfect at all. He's not not really a role model for us, but he does help us understand more about our journey of faith and who God is. 
God comes to Gideon. He chooses a young man who is far from who would be expected um, to be chosen by society. He uses Gideon's strength and works with his weaknesses. He sees Gideon's potential. God is a God who is patient, encouraging and faithful. God is still that God. He uses our strengths and he works with our weaknesses. He sees our potential. While we um, spend time in this series looking at the lives of people of faith, we see more and more that it is God who is faithful, God who is present, God who cares, and God who will meet you where you're at. So I have a few questions for us to just um, sit with and reflect on this morning as we think about the life of Gideon. i put them on the screen. So how might God want to use your personal skills and, and abilities to grow his kingdom? You can take some time now as we um, play some music and, and ask God about that. Where's your faith journey with God right now? What might be the next steps for you to deepen and grow your faith? This week, what is one thing that you can do to be more faithful in your life? Give us some time to think about that. Well, Stephen's going to play some music for us and then I'll come back. To you.